So welcome to Plant Factory session two, and this is Copyright Digital Art Live and Eon Software, presented today by Daniel Seabacker. This is session two. I'm going to go into a bit more depth today, and probably going to see this palm tree being created in front of your eyes, which would be uh, pretty special. Uh, so if everyone in the room can please give Daniel a warm welcome, uh, give him a pat on the back for his amazing presentation yesterday. Really appreciate that. I think we, we're all awed by the amount of control that we could see on what he was creating with those uh, grass stems and seeds and leaves. It's amazing. So uh, over to Daniel. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I ju was just reading the, the welcome messages. <laughs> so um, it's great to be back and to see some new faces and familiar ones as well. And thanks for the compliments. I'm happy that you enjoyed it yesterday. Um, so for today, this is what we're going to do now. Um, first, let's do a quick recap of yesterday. Uh, with just a couple of points to ease those into the webinar who weren't present yesterday. Then we will build uh, this palm tree and we will make use of advanced dependencies that are only available in um, TPF Producer and Studio. So um, <laughs> I hope you got your sleep warm. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, we'll also uh, take a look at wind animation. I hope that um, this will look fluid on your screens, um, but in any case, you will receive the full recording with a proper frame rate. So we'll, we'll uh, try and see how it goes. Um, then I promised I'd explain to you the concept of working with age, health and season. And we will also take a look at iteration nodes and the auto growth node. This is something that uh, Andrea was particularly interested in. And we will also talk about the different meshing modes for offline rendering versus real time rendering. And also uh, explore the creation of LODs, level of details, and um, explore the different meshing algorithms that are available, including quartz triangles and manual meshing as well. Um, from the plant that we built yesterday, I just wanted to give it a try to see whether um, it would also hold up in a render um, since it was pretty simple. So I just fired up Vue today and loaded up some of the <laughs> uh, sample plants um, that ship with TPF that, uh, that I did as well and added the grass node. So it's nothing special, but I just wanted to try it out and um, show to you that the plan can in fact be rendered. Okay, so let's get started and thanks Paul for keeping an eye on the chat box and um, yeah, so I'm re really looking forward to uh, this webinar today. So just a quick recap for those who weren't present yesterday and also for everyone else. Um, yester yesterday we um, first explored the interface and we saw that uh, we can use these presets on the left to draw a tree with the brush anywhere inside the 3D window. And all of these icons are basically modified presets of this node, which is the advanced segment node. And this is how TPF works. Uh, in almost every instance, you start with a cylindrical shape and you can then use about 100 different parameters to mold this cylindrical shape into anything you would like um, to have. And once you're satisfied, um, you can add another node. Oh, my sound is bad. Do you still hear me? Um, I can hear you. Um, there's just okay. a tiny bit of breakup, but mostly you're, you're fine. So let's carry on. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, once you're satisfied with the shape that you built, you're then going to add the next node. And by clicking here, the next node will automatically be linked to its parent, to the former node. And this one is considered to be a child of the, the, the parent. And in the parent node, um, you get a new tab which contains all the placement settings 
uh, where it can indicate where this node grows out from from the other node and that's the basic principle and um, yeah so that's what we were talking about yesterday and um, before we start building the palm tree I would like to um, show you the remaining nodes that we hadn't used yesterday. A few of them will be used throughout the building of the palm tree, um, but I still want to give them a shout out now because I intend to move forward a little bit uh, quicker than yesterday. Okay, so we explored the advanced segment node yesterday, and there's also a simple segment node which is a simplified version of the advanced node. For example, you cannot manipulate um, the axis inside this node, so uh, when you try to draw with this simple segment, you will always draw a straight line, no matter how you move your cursor. Um, this node is handy if you need a pretty straight uh, uh, stuff, uh, with not too many details, because it uh, computes a lot quicker. But it's always possible to switch from the simple segment to the advanced segment with the single click of a mouse button. Um, personally, I only use the advanced segment though, but I can uh, think of a couple of situations where the simple version might be useful as well. Uh, regarding the advanced or auto growth node, this is something that we will get back to later. Um, I would like to show the leaf node as well. Um, yesterday we had an example tree with billboards and billboards um, are made from this leaf node. Um, here you can select the orientation. By default this is a flat polygon. We could load an alpha map onto this polygon. Let's give it a try. Um, let's just use any of the materials the chip with TPF and this is a flat polygon that you cannot bend um, but if, if you uh, want to create individual leaves with a low polygon count for example uh, for trees that are located in the distance this is the this is the pretty good way to do it and by changing the orientation from fixed user defined to fixed facing current camera we just created um, um, a baked version of the leaf that was uh, baked in, in, in its orientation uh, with the current camera. And by cha changing this to other fixed orientations, we can bake it into another direction. And by changing this to dynamic facing camera, we just created the billboard. You can see that no matter how I rotate the scene, um, the geometry is always rotated to face the current camera. And this is what we had yesterday in our example plant. Um, okay, so that's the leaf node. Um, we also have the object node, which we haven't used yesterday. I mentioned that TPF supports um, five different types of leaf geometry, one being billboards, and the second one being the single flat leaf, both of which we just saw with the leaf node. The third one being blades for modeling leaves with real th uh, 3D geometry. The fourth one being the warp board, which is a bent version of the flat polygon plane. And the fifth one being the object node. You can uh, load an external object in here by adding the object node to your graph. And um, of course, it, um, it's, only useful, it's also useful for other stuff than uh, leaves only. You can use it to load fruits that you model externally, for example. Um, yeah, so the possibilities are endless. So this is the way to get an external object into your plant. And uh, finally, we have uh, two nodes that first look the same. One is a simple ball geometry. This really doesn't do anything special. It simply creates a ball and nothing else um, around sphere. Um, you can influence the radius and that's about it. And there's a second node called Urchin. And this also creates a sphere, but with one difference. You can spread other things um, around uh, the sphere uh, uh, on its surface. So for example, let's add a simple segment. And you can see how that one is being spread around the main sphere. Um, so this is particularly useful for flowers, for example. 
um, because you can spread uh, petals all around this this um, sphere and you can indicate the number you can change um, the spread angle once again this is the same as the spiral coil angle that we used for the leaves yesterday so this is a pretty good example to see how things start to revolve around the sphere and um, you can also place these instances only in the upper half or lower half um, yeah so this node both distributes um, other children and it generates a spherical geometry so these conclude all of the nodes that are available in TPF and we will make use of a couple of uh, these new geometry nodes uh, within today's session um, there are uh, two more things that I would like to show to you um, yesterday we um, took a look at how manual additions in the 3D view are reflected in the settings in the plant graph. So let me just simply add two nodes to the scene so that we have sort of a branching structure. And yesterday I showed you that you can select um, any individual node or child instance and you can manipulate this node and um, yeah, shape it. And if we go back to the entire um, node so that all the children are selected, we can um, now go to the variation that we just created. So this is what I showed you yesterday. And I also mentioned that um, by clicking on the setting that you just changed, in this case the length, and clicking revert, we remove that variation and go back to um, yeah, the overall settings that are there for all the children. However, that's also possible the other way around. So instead of um, using the 3D view to um, manipulate a single instance, you can always um, select an ind any individual instance in the 3D view and then you can click on any of the settings here. Let's go to the length. Uh, with the right with the right mouse button and say make unique and now this setting and only this setting becomes available for you to change so it's exactly what we did in the 3d view um, but this time we entered it from the other way around so um, we used the panel to make something unique and by clicking and choosing revert we're undoing um, our change and deleted the variation um, yeah, so that basically sums up what I wanted to um, show you today as an introduction and I'd say we can start building a palm tree unless there are any questions that came up since yesterday that you would like to have answered in advance. Um, my textures, um, I usually uh, scan them in with, uh, with a scanner at home. Uh, with um, at least 600 dpi or 1200 dpi and then I use Photoshop to extract um, uh, the, the leaves from the background and maybe clone away some um, jagged ed edges and um, yeah then I use external software such as shader map or recently um, substance designer which I just purchased or bitmap to material to generate the other maps um, what are you referring to with per scale imported objects? Could you rephrase that? Ah, uh, okay. Um, no, you don't. Um, I can show this to you. Let's add an object node. And let's load an external object. I'll, that's something that we'll, we're going to use for the palm later on. Um, and by going to the transform tab you have access to all the scaling parameters so you can rescale the object inside plant factory okay so if if there are no other questions then I'd say let's turn to building our palm tree so, as I said, I'd like to move a little bit quicker than yesterday. 
um, with building the palm tree because there's so much more interesting stuff that we're going to see today. <laughs> so let's um, yeah speed up a little bit regarding the basics. Um, first, we need a cylinder to build our trunk. So let's add an advanced segment node. And I would like the length to be about 7.5 meters. And the radius should be around 0.1, so that we have a nice, um, uh, yeah, thin palm tree. I also explained the orange curves yesterday. So with the orange curves, you can influence the strength of any setting that has an orange curve along um, the the length uh, along the height of the geometry. So this is the bottom of um, the the geometry, and this is the top. And by using this curve, we can now make that plant thinner um, towards the top. So the radius is about to decrease. I think that's a little too, too much. Let's use it like that. Okay. Um. I also showed you yesterday that when you manipulate the um, axis with the gizmo tools in here, this um, change is uh, being reflected uh, in here in the axis editor. So by clicking this pen icon, uh, we are in another uh, form of, of axis editor where we can influence the shape as well. And the great thing is that you can um, save these axis shapes that you create to your own library and then you can reload them. And this is what we're going to do now for our palm tree. I already created one axis shape um, in advance to today's session. We're simply going to load this one in and we have a nice curly or curvy um, shape for our, for our coconut palm tree. Let's also rename this um, to trunk. Yes, I'm working with meters. You can see the um, the, uh, the units down here in the bottom left corner. Okay, so um, I would also like the trunk to have a few um, roots as well. And I don't want to have um, full roots. I, d I don't even know if palm trees have real uh, roots that, that go very deep. So let's simply um, activate the function root flares. Um, this will extend the base and will make it swell and this imitates the beginning of my um, roots. So we can indicate the numbers of roots and um, I think that one is al also okay. We're not going to use too much of a variation in here. And um, let's decrease the height of the swelling. I think about 0.42 should be fine. And I would also like to reduce the amount of swell. And let's decrease the depth. I'll subdivide the plant a bit more so that we can see the roots better. Yeah, there we are. So the depth um, is basically the extrusion value for for uh, the roots. So by decreasing the depth, we can um, decrease the amount of of uh, protru protrusion from the bottom of uh, the plant. And I don't, I think the width is okay. Just to show you what the setting does, um, you can make very wide. Um, root flares as well. So I'm pretty satisfied with the way this looks right now. Okay, so next up we are going to add our uh, leaves. However, we need to think about how the leaves are going to be distributed. And looking at real palm trees, the leaves go um, yeah, around uh, the top in 360 degrees. And um, there are a couple of leaves with a lower angle that are hanging down, a couple of leaves that are hanging up. And while we could um, try to add our leaves directly to the top of the trunk and selecting um, place the leaves at the tip, I think it's going to be hard to imitate this 360 degrees um, placement. 
So instead, we're going to use the urchin that I just showed you. So let's add an urchin. And now we are back at the parents tab and the, um, the trunk now has a new tab called urchin. And we want to move this urchin to the top of our um, trunk. So let's go to the placement group and select start from the tip of the segment. Okay, so let's also remove the angle so that the urchin sits up straight in the middle. And now within the urchin node, um, we need to reduce the radius, obviously, because that's way too big. So I want to make this really, really tiny because it's basically uh, going to be the new growth center for all of the leaves. They will come out of, of the urchin, so the urchin can be almost invisible. Okay. In fact, we are going to make this invisible now. Um, by selecting the skin and setting this to none. What this just did was uh, we are using the urchin node now as a multiplication node only, similar to the hydro node that we used yesterday to create an, um, numerous instances of the grass plant. And so the, the sphere is still there, um, it's just not visible anymore. So everything is going to be distributed around that sphere. And I think, let's just make this visible again, that I'll move this a little bit down and make it overlap just in case since we're going to animate this later. And I know that wind animation can be... Oh, that's the scaling. I need the offset. I know that wind animation can sometimes move things around quite a lot, so I'd like to... Um, set this to a smaller value just to make sure that um, hmm, the urchin and and the the stem overlap a bit or maybe I'll just wait <laughs> um, until later after all um, yeah we'll come back to to this offset just in case if it doesn't look good with wind animation um, uh, no, I couldn't have used the Hydra um, instead of the Urchin, um, and you will see why in just a moment uh, when we add the additional leaves. So, um, just wait a second, I can show it to you directly. We're going to create um, the twig for our um, leaves. So, here's our segment, I'll call this um, Palm Twigs. Palm Twig and let's connect this to the urchin yeah and now imagine if we had used the hydra object we would not have been able to get these tricks uh, uh, twigs pointing downwards and sidewards and upwards we could only make them point all into one um, direction and there is no way to make a 360 degree distribution basically um, the hydra object distributes everything um, just um, uh, two-dimensionally and the urchin distributes everything in three dimensions. Does that um, make it clear? Okay, good. So for uh, the twigs uh, we need to reduce the length so let's use something like 4.2 plus minus 35 for a little bit of variation. And for the radius. Um, we also want to decrease the radius. Um, however, um, with the radius you can s uh, select between three different modes. Either you set a radius that is totally independent from the parent, or you set a radius that is inherited by the radius from the parent. So if the parent has a radius of two meters and you set this to inherit and to 50% the radius in here will be one meter. So when you change the radius of the parent, the radius of the child changes as well. And we are going to use the inherit clamped to radius. So um, this makes sure that um, it's going to inherit the radius of the parent. However, despite the inheritance, it's not going to um, exceed the limit that we set here. 
and I'm going to set this limit pretty low. So let's use 0 0.07 And um, I would also like to influence uh, the radius along um, the length. So let's make our twig a little thinner at the end. And for this, I really wanted to fade out into nothing, into, z into zero. So um, this looks good. Um, okay, so uh, let's say uh, we want to now influence the distribution of our palm twig leaves, of our palm twigs. So let's get back to the urchin. And for this, first I would like to um, reduce the number and add a little bit of variation. So 20 plus minus 4. And I also want the twigs to start um, uh, in the upper half of the sphere, so I'll use 0 0.59, and this way our palm uh, uh, le uh, leaves will only start uh, to grow in the upper half. And uh, the ending parameter is fine. And finally, let's adjust the um, angle a little bit. I experimented um, with uh, separate angles, and I found that for po for my palm tree, a value of 81 um, produced good-looking results. Okay, so um, I think I'm satisfied with uh, the placement. So let's get back to our palm twig and start uh, curving this. So, um, yesterday Uwe was asking uh, why I didn't use tropism um, for curling um, the, um, uh, the, the uh, grass uh, leaves, the grass plant leaves. And I said, well, it doesn't matter if you use tropism or a uh, local bias and set it to curl, uh, despite the fact that you have a little bit more control with the local bias. But uh, so today I thought, well, uh, we don't need that control, so just so that you've seen the um, the setting once, let's use um, the tropism parameter instead of the curling today. So some will uh, slightly curl upwards, some will uh, slightly curl downwards, and some will uh, will not curl that much at all. Um, I would also like to influence the curling so that it only starts um, or that it starts with a lesser strength at the beginning, so let's use the curve again and set it to something like this maybe. Yeah, that looks good to me. And I think we can turn to the Influences tab. So, um, despite the uh, tropism that I used, I would like to uh, still use a curl bias as well to introduce some additional curling that I can uh, control independently from the other curl. So let's set this to curl. And I think a value of 1 is OK, plus minus 0.25. And of course this looks a little bit too um, curly, <laughs> especially at the end of, of uh, the twigs. So let's once again use uh, the filter and reduce the um, amount of curling a little bit. Um, and this time I would like to use the local coordinate system because all of the um, th uh, leaves are placed at a different height. And so this is what I would like to see, that every palm uh, leaf um, twig is curled into a slightly different direction. And I think I would like the curl to be stronger at the very end of the palm leaf, palm twig, sorry. So let's try it like that. Okay. And of course, we still need um, to uh, 
bend this down towards the ground. So this time we're using a direction bias. And this is a little bit too strong. Um, so I just reverse that one and dun, 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 let's try it with something like this. So sorry I didn't want to point it towards the ground that one was um, I want to do exactly the opposite. <laughs> and now it's time for um, the uh, green filters which we haven't talked about yesterday. So what are the green filters? As I said, with the orange filters, you can control the strength of a setting um, along the uh, current geometry's um, height or position um, along the height. With the green filters, you can do the same, but it's not depending on the position of the current geometry of the twig. Instead, it's b uh, based on the position uh, on the parent, in this case, the urchin. So I can now influence how much uh, this direction strength is going, uh, how strong this is going to be, depending on where the tricks are growing from on the urchin. So I can show you an extreme effect by moving this curve down. Maybe something like this as well. So um, right now only um, if, uh, the very beginning tweaks are uh, being affected by uh, this direction bias and the others are not. Maybe let's try it with um, a twist bias instead so that you can see a little better. I'll just try to create an extreme effect for you and somehow it doesn't have any effect. I don't know why. Let's try swirling instead. No? Okay. Um, yeah, let's try the perturbation setting to demonstrate this filter to you. So every twig is perturbated now and by using the parent curve setting this to zero and like this you can now see that only the twigs here at the bottom of of the urchin are being affected and the twigs that grow uh, out from the top of the urchin are not affected by um, uh, the perturbation because the strength is, is zero there. So this is an incredibly useful filter for creating very advanced dependencies. So let's reset this and let's get back to our original bias and use direction again. I think I had a strength of point twenty seven along the c-axis and now let's use the parent filter to deactivate the strength um, until here and something like this. So this is going to be a subtle change but um, yeah nonetheless I think we're going to use this one. Okay and I also would like to um, rotate um, our twigs so that they point more towards the ground. For this I will go to the transform tab and let's use the rotation angles of 34 degrees and also a rotation around Z for 270 degrees. So this looks more like, uh, like it, more like our palm tree and I would also like to influence the rotation angles from X uh, with the parent curve. Okay, so um, d thanks to the parent curve uh, in here and in here with the direction bias, um, these uh, lower twigs are now pointing more towards the ground than the upper twi twigs, which will create the typical uh, palm tree shape. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, there's no uh, pending questions in the chat box so far, but uh, if anyone's got questions now from that last section, please uh, put them in the chat box. 
Okay, nothing, okay. then we'll continue. Um, so the next question answering session will be once the plant is finished, which uh, I hope will be in about 10 minutes. So um, finally, all we're uh, missing for now are the leaves that we're going to attach to our twigs. So let's add another advanced segment because we're going to use individual leaves. So I would like to model them in 3D using blades. So let's n rename this palm leaf. And I'll already activate blades and set the radius to zero. And let's connect this to our palm twig. Yeah, <laughs> looks great, doesn't it? Um, so uh, what we're going to to need is um, sorry, I just I'm just looking for the right settings. <laughs> there, there they are. Okay, so I used a value of 1.23 plus minus 0.1 as a variation for the length. And let's change the width to full width and to 0 0.3 plus minus 0 0.1. And uh, we can also use the auto size parameter. So in this case, um, TPF um, adjusts the size according to the diameter and length of the parent. So that's a pretty good way to not have to fiddle with the settings too much. You can um, define the aspect ratio with uh, these settings and uh, can let you can let TPF do the rest. So um, before we model our leaves, let's go back to the palm twig, uh, twig and adjust the placement of the leaves. Um, so I really want to have quite a lot of leaves on every twig. So let's use a number of 65 children plus minus 10 and um, we need the angle to be a little bit more steep so let's use 56 as the angle and I would like the first um, twigs to be not quite as steep as uh, the later ones so let's use the orange curve and uh, reduce the strength a little bit along the current plant twig. We also need to rotate the leaves so that they're pointing downwards which is by minus 90 degrees and I would like to move them a little bit along uh, the twigs by 30 degrees. And this already looks quite like poultry. So, um, yeah, now it's time to shape this leaf um, into real 3D geometry. So, for um, our for our um, palm leaf, I um, already started shaping, shaping this one. And uh, we're going to use the section filter again. Let's change this to a curve. And I would like the leaves to be round. So let's adjust the filter. And I would also like our leaves to taper at the end. So let's use the profile. Uh, curve to shape um, yeah the the profile of our leaves so this is similar to what we did yesterday with the um, leaves for our grass plant where we used the same settings this looks quite nice to me and now we need to reduce uh, the section height a little bit so let's use something like this plus minus one 
and of course we also need um, the leaves to uh, curl a little bit but I would also like to add s just a slight distortion to them so let's use the axis perturbation again so not all the leaves are totally straight anymore and finally let's add a curl by activating local bias with local coordinates along um, a negative y-axis so that they're curling towards um, the ground and I think the strength is a little bit too much so use let's use something like this okay and so the geometry of our palm tree is basically finished this is what it looks like now um, I would like to um, add the textures now so let's get back to our trunk and I already prepared uh, the texture so we don't need to um, reload every single map so we can simply go to the segment body or sorry to the root in this case and um, let's load the texture that I prepared the material to speed things up so let's load the coconut bark I think this one ships with TPF as well and uh, we need to we need to adjust um, the material mapping I think so let's go to the trunk and to the materials tab check parametric and use a v-tile of maybe three and a u-tile of five probably no that's too much uh, maybe f three as well mm, two I'll just I'll just stick with these values <laughs> for the time being. Um, okay, next up our urchin. Uh, we wanted to make this one invisible, so let's set the skin to none. And we can now clearly see that our leaves are hovering a little bit um, above the the um, trunk because in here is our invisible sphere. So let's go to our transform tab and now really use that C offset value that I wanted to use earlier to move the, uh, the sphere, the invisible sphere, a little bit downwards towards the, the tip of our trunk. And now for our palm twigs and leaves. So for simplicity reasons we're going to use the same material on both. And um, Yes, Olivier, you're right. Um, the end leaves should be shorter than the others. Thank you, I forgot about this. We're, we're going to fix it within a second. Um, thanks for pointing it out. Okay, so um, once again to the segment body uh, we can now add a new material. Um, so let's load one of the materials that I prepared. And now I'm going to show you something pretty interesting. Within TPF you can use more than one material for um, each node and TPF will then um, pick between um, all the materials that are assigned to them randomly. So right now we have um, green leaves everywhere and I would also like um, to add some more uh, color variation so let's add another material called an alternate material and now we can switch back and forth between the two materials and I'm going to load the second material as well and this time let's use the brown leaves oh that was the wrong <laughs> the wrong material um, I wanted to load that one indeed um, yep and finally let's add a third material and this time we're going to use fully brown leaves okay and 
uh, plant factory will now randomly switch between these uh, three materials. This is not what I intend to do, but before uh, we're going to do this, let's fix the length um, of the uh, palm leaves that Olivier pointed out. Um, he was totally right about that. So, um, let me see where we need to use uh, the length parameter in here. Um, also, did I use that length? No, I didn't. So, uh, we still need to make um, the twigs shorter as well, based on the position on the urchin. So, let's do that one. Okay. And now, let's also shorten uh, the length of our palm leaves. And let's change this to a curve and move this down, maybe something like this. I think they can still get a little shorter at the end. Um, maybe even a little more. Yeah, that looks good to me. And we easily fixed the length of our palm tree leaves. So, um, the palm uh, automatically inherits the same material for the blades, so we don't need to set this up anymore. Uh, it inherits the uh, material from the palm twig. Now about that material distribution. What I would like to achieve is that all the top leaves should be green, then um, the intermediate leaves should uh, be of that intermediate green and brown color, and the bottom leaves should be brown. So we need a way to tell TPF, no, please don't distribute these materials randomly. Please distribute them um, based on the position um, of, the, of the twig on the urchin. And there is a way to do this. And um, we're now going into a territory that is only available in producer and studio, and it's incredibly powerful. By clicking the plus of each node. You can unfold the node and see all the inputs and outputs. And by clicking uh, the other plus which says additional parameters, we can now unfold every single setting on every single uh, tab of the node and we can um, influence or control every of these settings with other nodes. So we can create for example dependencies between length and gnarliness or between the length of the trunk and the palm twigs, etc., simply by linking both parameters together. And in this case, we want to influence the distribution of the materials, which is currently set to random. So let's unfold the materials group, and we want to uh, influence the distribution of our segment material. And now we can connect something to the distribution. And this is where we now explore uh, other node categories for the first time. So here is a category called miscellaneous nodes. And these nodes allow to build incredibly um, elaborate dependencies. And in this case, we want to make the distribution of the material uh, depend on a parameter of the urchin, which is the parent. So let's load the parent parameters miscellaneous node. Inside this node, we can now select our urchin, which is the parent to, to the, our palm twig. And from the urchin, we can say we'd like to have the position of the twig on the urchin. And uh, by default, um, this outputs the position between a value of 0 to 1. So 0 is the bottom and 1 is the top. And um, the material distribution also uses a value of uh, 0 to 1. So in this case, we have three materials, and each material with which um, at a value of around um, 30, 0 0.33, 1 divided by 3. And so let's connect the parent parameters to our material distribution. And this uh, is exactly what we uh, were looking for, uh, just that the colors are reversed. So we need to change uh, the output of the parent parameters node from 0 to 1 and invert it to 1 to 0 so that the material distribution is going to be inverted as well. For this, we're going to add a filter node. And I'll use a map node. 
and with this I can remap any value. So let's say our input is 0 to 1 and we would like to reverse this input f uh, f to 1 to 0 and let's connect this to the distribution and there we are we just um, yeah change the distribution of the materials and they now change according to uh, the position and the height along the urchin any questions <laughs> Um, yeah, so the three materials are really simple in the material editor. Um, I uh, only used um, a grass texture that I scanned, so it's not even a palm texture with a normal map. And that's about it. It's only... Um, I, I, I overlaid a gradient in Photoshop for um, creating the other two materials. And uh, since I knew we wouldn't need an alpha map, I could simply... Um, yeah, used that uh, quad, uh, rectangular texture and didn't have to cut anything out because we were doing that in TPF with modeling. Um, yes, that should also be possible. Um, Olivier, there is an option if you go into the palm leaf and um, into the blades group. Currently, um, the blades are uh, automatically inheriting the material of the twigs. So if I um, do this manually and add another material and the third one, I can now select um, the distribution whether um, the distribution should be uh, unique per, per segment or per blade. And uh, since w uh, we don't have the segment, which would be the cylinder um, visible uh, for each individual leaf, uh, there is no visible change. But if we had the segment active, then um, I guess both the blade and the segment would have the same uh, material. And you can also um, propose sequences for the material distribution. Um, yeah, so there are quite a lot of possibilities. And by using these external um, miscellaneous notes, you have in-depth control on how to mix and match materials within a single object. Okay, I'll simply delete all the other materials so that we're back to inheriting. Okay, so no further questions, then I would like to show you what I came up with um, just uh, 30 minutes before the webinar. Um, yesterday I promised you that we talk about meshing modes and um, so let's get to the meshing tab. And while I would like to um, postpone a couple of these settings until later, I would like to um, focus on the geometry tar target group for now. Um, TPF uh, is of course um, capable of modeling trees that can both be used for offline rendering and uh, for real-time rendering. And the cool thing is that you don't need to create two documents, uh, one with a high resolution plan for offline rendering and one with a simplified plan for um, real-time rendering. Instead, you can create both models within a single document, within a single scene file. And that's what we're doing right now. So let's add another control node. So uh, go to miscellaneous nodes and we're going to use the geometry target selector. So I'll remove the connection from the urchin and instead I'll connect the geometry target selector. And to the selector, let's unfold this. We have three different outputs. And so this is obviously a very high resolution uh, uh, plant with individual leaves. So this is going to be used for the offline output. Now I would like to create a low resolution simplified version of that palm twig where we don't have individual leaves but rather one texture mapped blade and w this is what we're going to use for the real-time output. So let's copy and paste our palm twig 
and use this palm tweak for our real-time output. And if I now go back to the meshing tab and switch the geometry target to real-time, this is going to be generated instead of these nodes. And so by activating blades and setting our radius to user defined and to zero, um, we can now add a low resolution uh, texture to our plates, which I will do right now. So let's get back to the material tab and load a new material, which are already prepared. Palm tree, low res, uh, palm tree leaves green. And let's add another material. Um, brown. And finally the yellow material. And once again, we need to connect our distribution to um, that material as well. So in this case, we're using the material of the blades. So let's get back to the blades material group and connect the distribution to this one as well. And we're back to our, to our uh, distribution of materials along the height. And finally, I'd like to shape um, this, uh, this uh, flat geometry a little bit. Let's unsubdivide the plant. And um, so let's use the section filter again. And I'll simply move this point down to minus one this one as well. I n will switch the width to full width again. And now we um, curved our, our uh, blades. And finally, I'd like to edit the profile once again to make um, the blade more narrow at the very top. And so this is obviously um, now cutting off our texture and I don't want our texture to be cut off here. And this is what the pinching parameter is good for. By setting pinching to one, instead of cutting off the texture, the texture is simply going to be shrinked at the top. And um, yeah, so now we have a low resolution palm tree with 20,000 polygons. We could even unsubdivide this even more. So 5,000 polygons. And by going to the meshing tab and switching to offline, we get the high resolution uh, palm tree back with individual leaves and almost 200,000 polygons. Any questions about uh, this workflow? <laughs> I will uh, save the work, Uwe. I still have the finished scene um, ready anyways. So if TPF had crashed, <laughs> I'd have a backup. Yeah, just to say, um, throughout the two sessions so far, we've seen uh, TPF being quite stable, haven't we? It looks to be really quite stable software. Yeah, it is. There are very seldom uh, crashes in TPF, and if they are, there are any, then it's usually related to um, uh, to plants that are so polygon, polygon heavy that you suddenly have 5 million polygons and uh, TPF crashes <laughs> because your machine cannot handle um, the amount of polygons. So you need to be, be a little bit careful about pushing certain settings. Um, uh, question for Bruno about, yep. could you unfold the geometry target, please? Yes. That's what it looks like. So you can um, use this as, as a switch, and it swi will switch between all the inputs that are connected to here um, based on um, the target that you set in the meshing tab for export. 
later. And uh, there's also a new stylized version, um, which I will not go into detail right now, but that can be used for um, a low resolution um, preview of your your entire plant. So um, it doesn't work properly with every every tree, um, so the palm tree is not fit for it, but if you had um, a, a broadly, for example, it would look a lot better. So this is good for creating low polygon placeholders uh, of your plant, for example, and replacing them with uh, the final shape uh, once your project is finished. Okay, so um, any questions so far uh, despite the unfolding of the geometry? No? Okay, so um, then I'd say let's give uh, wind animation a try. I read in the chat that uh, the screen froze uh, uh, for a couple of people um, every now and then. So I hope uh, we will be able to make use of uh, the wind animation uh, within TPF uh, despite the, the screen problems. Okay, so before we um, add wind animation to this uh, palm tree, um, I would like to explain how wind in Plant Factory works. Um, for this I'm going to add um, a couple of notes to a new empty scene um, to demonstrate the different kind of movements um, that TPF creates for a wind. Um, the wind algorithm has been completely rewritten in version 2015. So if there are any users out there, um, Uwe for example, who still work with uh, version 2014, um, everything that I'm going to show you uh, now is not applicable to version 2014. The wind looks uh, incredibly good um, but it's also incredibly complicated to configure <laughs> um, okay so um, let's add a segment and let's add a leaf node as well not to the segment but to the root so that they're going to be placed next to each other and the fixed user defined orientation is fine I want to move this a little bit to the right and let's add a warp board as well And let's connect this to the root as well. And let's move the this th four meters to the right. And finally, let's add another advanced segment. And this time we're going to use blades so that we have a representation of all the different kinds of geometry and how they react to wind. So um, this is something that we're going to move to the left and let's activate blades, let's decrease the length and maybe m let's move that even further to the left. Okay, so um, um, okay Andre, I will take a look at this link uh, later uh, if we have time. <laughs> um, okay, so generally speaking you can activate wind by clicking this button. Um, you can see that wind is by default activated only on the leaf node and not on the other nodes, so they are not moving in the wind currently. Um, by doing a right click on um, on uh, the animation, uh, you can uh, set the preview for the animation, how long it should be, so I think five seconds are enough for this example and you don't really need to go that high uh, with uh, the frame rate at all because TPF will interpolate between frames so things will look fluid nonetheless and uh, by clicking cy cyclic animation um, you get a smooth transition between the be beginning and the end of the animation preview <coughs> okay so um, TPF has um, two or, or three different kinds of wind and these different kinds of wind are carried over from VU. Um, I will open the atmosphere editor now. And so the atmosphere editor is only present in uh, producer, but you still can open uh, the editor with the wind tab only in studio. So um, you do have access to the wind settings in studio as well. 
So Vue users might know this tab and they will probably um, not have used that very much because it's not as intuitive if you don't, if you don't know what these settings do. Um, so imagine that uh, you have a scene, the scene file, and uh, you have ventilators that are um, blowing wind um, through the scene onto the geometry. And in here, uh, in the uh, brief settings, you can configure the strength of these ventilators, how strongly they blow wind through the scene, and how fast they blow wind to the, th to the scene, um, and how uh, regularly uh, the strength of the, the wind that's blowing through the scene is, or whether it varies from time to time. And there's also a second ventilator, which uh, produces sudden gusts of wind. So just imagine that this is a ventilator that blows wind um, onto uh, the geometry constantly. And this is a second ventilator that randomly turns on and off and um, blows additional wind on uh, to the geometry, thus creating uh, the movement of gusts of wind. And TPF differentiates between these two types of wind. So the breeze is called ambient uh, motion breeze within the nodes. And this random movement that occurs every now and then is uh, uh, named gusts of wind. And within the wind tab, there is a third type of wind, which is called the constant wind. And uh, for Vue users, when you think um, about your plants in Vue and you look at a plant from the top view, there's a blue triangle that you can drag to deform the plant strongly for, uh, under a wind that's blowing from a constant direction. And this is what the constant wind is doing. So by entering the strength and the direction here, you're basically moving that blue triangle that you know from Vue, and this will deform the plant into a specific direction. So um, keep in mind that these three types of wind make up the wind animation TPF. The basic breeze, which is that one, the gusts of wind, which is the second ventilator, and the optional constant wind. And within uh, the nodes, you can now turn on uh, whether the nodes react to only this ambient motion breeze or also to the gusts of wind and the constant wind. So um, let's give this a try. Uh, we'll first take a look at um, the the um, segment, so which one is that one? Okay, I'll rename that Blades. And so let's turn on the uh, default breeze for a moment. And TPF tells you that whenever you activate wind effects, um, it will create bones for every part of the geometry. And uh, TPF asks you if that is okay. So yes, that is okay. We don't want to see this message again. Now we can already see that we created four bones. And by clicking this button, we can see the uh, export rig of that plant. So every bone starts from the scene origin. And we currently have uh, activated bones for, um, or wind for two nodes. So that's why there's one bone here and one bone there. Um, okay. So let's see what uh, this looks like when we now turn on the wind animation. So the cylinder is moving very slightly back and forth. Um, so um, it's uh, actually deforming the the segment, uh, the axis that's running through the cylinder is being deformed by the wind algorithm. I'll demonstrate that to you by increasing um, the flexibility of that cylinder. Let's set this to 10 maybe. And you can now see uh, that it's moving a lot stronger. Yeah. So uh, the first thing to take note of is that um, geometry without axis, for example this leaf or the warp board when I turn on the wind, only supports um, the ambient motion breeze and this will result in a rotating movement. So um, in this case, it's rotated along the x-axis back and forth. But with geometry such as the segment or the segment with blades, if I turn that on as well, 
um, it's not only rotated, it's actually deformed. So um, let's increase this one as well. It's not working. Why isn't it working? Oh, I need to increase the flexibility, of course. Oh, I can't go higher. Okay. Yeah, now the left cylinder is working as well. Okay, so um, the amount, uh, the the rhythm in which um, that um, that uh, geometry is moving back and forth is defined by the behavior of that invisible ventilator, the the breeze settings in that first group. So if I increase the intensity, you can see that it's uh, moving a lot stronger now. So um, you can use the atmosphere editor to simulate um, how the plant behaves um, under different wind conditions. By default, it, um, the settings represent a calm wind, uh, wind condition. And um, yeah, you can increase these settings to try it out how your plant would look uh, in uh, uh, under strong winds. Um, so let's add this back to 20%. Okay. And um, so if I now go to the wind group, um, we are presented with a ton of sliders. Um, I cannot walk you through each of these sliders because it's quite a lot, but the basic idea is that you turn on wind in every single note, and um, before you start tweaking the strength of the wind in every uh, note, you rather use the sliders over here to tweak the wind globally. For example, you can say, okay, I would like the atmospheric breeze to um, affect um, leaves, so this kind of notes, less. So you can then go to the group influence of wind on leaves, on leaf notes, the warp board is also included in leaf notes, and you can then reduce the overall influence and only the leaf, leaf notes will then move less, which you can see now. The cylinder is still moving very strongly and the influence of the leaves um, is now decreased. We can also make the leaf move, leaves move quicker, for example. So by entering 400% into the speed value, you can see that the middle, middle leaf is now uh, even jittering. And if we wanted to um, influence the strength of all the segments, uh, so to speak, the trunks and the branches, we can go to the group influence of wind on segments and influ uh, se use these sliders to decrease or increase the overall speed and intensity that this ventilator has on segment notes only. Um, for blades, there's one thing you have to keep in mind. Even though we can go to the blade and set the radius to zero to remove the cylinder so that only the blade is left, um, the blade itself is still being bent heavily um, by the axis that runs through it. And the axis is considered to be that invisible segment. So if we now want to decrease the movement of this plate, we still do this within the influence of wind on segments group and not uh, within the influence of wind on blades group, because this um, is a movement along um, yeah, the deformation of the axis. And um, so uh, if we go back to the um, influences tab of the blade, we can also see that we have um, another setting here, which reads influence of blades. And if we increase the setting, we will um, decrease the deformation strength of segments that uh, you, uh, have blades activated, which is exactly what we want to use here because it's moving way too much. So that was a little bit too strong. The, the setting is very sensitive. So by just adding a little bit of influence uh, of plates, um, we made sure that um, that uh, blade uh, segment um, movement didn't go crazy. Okay, so there's one more thing regarding the basic ambient motion. And this is this setting here. Um, this setting can be found uh, also on the wind tab and you can edit it here and um, this will influence the amount that 
um, all the geometry can move for the entire plant. And um, you can also configure it in each node individually. And this way, um, yeah, you can override the global uh, response of the breeze for a single node only. So let's get into this here and we're uh, uh, greeted with a matrix. So this is uh, grayed out because this is only applicable for the wind animation of billboards, which we're not going to get into today. Um, but for example, if I wanted to make the blade not move along the x-axis, so back and forth as all the other things, I could deactivate this and make it move along the y-axis, for example. And now we can see that it's moving from left to right instead of back and forth. Or we could make it move um, around the z-axis. And now it uh, starts to deform along that axis as well. And you can set the maximum amount of movement that is allowed with uh, these basic wind settings. And of course, um, uh, if you load another breeze, uh, breeze preset such as the Stormy Breeze, <laughs> um, things, uh, the things that you enter here uh, get intensified by these values. So they're basically multiplied with each other. So the values that you enter here are valid for the default breeze settings that I'm going to reload. So um, this is a way to uh, really um, constrain the movement of any individual branches or leaves along one or a separate axis. You can also indicate the speed of movement, so let's say 3 per second, and you can now see that um, the movement is faster for the blade. And finally, um, in, a uh, in a tree all the things all leaves and branches don't move at the same time. So here you can indicate whether um, individual copies of um, that blade, if we had several blades scattered around a tree, for example, are allowed to move randomly or not. And um, now about that fluttering boost. Uh, when you think about um, the reality, um, you often have a subtle movement of winds on a, on a calm day and then there's suddenly a gust of wind that makes the leaves move faster and stronger. And uh, the gusts of wind are produced by this second um, setting within um, the atmosphere editor. So if we set gusts of wind to zero, um, no fluttering will occur at all. Um, but as long as the gusts of wind are active, um, there will be uh, some random strong movements and uh, here you can indicate what kind of effect these r uh, random movements produce. So you can um, say, okay, I would like to the amplitude um, of movement to increase by uh, three times when a gust of wind occurs and I would like the speed to, to uh, increase by two times, for example. So that's the ambient motion breeze. Um, the flexibility defines how strongly um, the the geometry can deform and so um, it can make um, a plant look uh, rather stiff or rather flexible like rubber for example. And now about that blade. There, uh, let's turn off the ambient motion for the blade so the blade's not moving anymore. There is also an ambient motion of blades which I'm going to show you now. And uh, by activating the wireframe we can get a better view of what's happening. That's the old wind that was present in uh, TPF 2014 and the good thing is that it doesn't need bones. So let's increase the strength of that effect by setting this to 10 and this creates a wavy deformation so that's a good way of simulating how uh, wind is uh, uh, going through um, through leaves, for example. And by increasing the frequency, you can um, increase the, the or decrease the scaling of uh, the wavy movement. So that's what it looks like um, now. So that's the ambient motion of blades, only available for um, blades. And finally, by activating the wind and gust motion, once again, this uh, will create bones. Um, by activating the wind and gust motion, we have another uh, movement that is uh, added on top of that basic breeze. And this movement only occurs when gusts of wind are moving through the scene. 
So let's increase the wind strength to 5 and let's uh, make the segment visible again and point 2 maybe and remove the influence of blades and now you can see that in contrast to these three types of geometry which only move back and forth um, the gust of wind um, distorts the um, geometry randomly into any direction and f uh, once you activated this there is also uh, the possibility to activate the wind and gust motion of blades and uh, this will deform the blade itself because right now all uh, movement that we observed was only related to the axis and uh, the blades themselves can be deformed as well let's try a wind strength of 50 and see what that looks like yeah so this will deform the blade as well and of course you can always control the strength of the flexibility with filters and um, also for wind animation you have a gravity parameter the gravity itself uh, can be set globally for the entire scene on the setup tab gravity strength and you can then activate gravity for each um, node separately and by activating gravity um, sorry let's use it here um, gravity will then bend the plant uh, more towards the ground which is not clearly visible at the moment um, but if we had branches connect to this one they would now curl towards the ground while moving in the wind so um, to sum up the wind animation you can um, activate the ambient motion breeze group um, as a basic movement and you can then activate wind and gust deformation for segments only all the other nodes only offer the ambient motion breeze you can override the uh, ranges of movement on a per node basis or you can set it universally um, for the entire scene uh, here on the atmospheric breeze tab and then um, in order to tweak the breeze globally for the entire plant just go to the corresponding group if you want to tweak the wind for segment nodes um, use the influence of wind on segments for the blade deformation the back and forth that we're seeing right here use the influ influence of wind on blades and for um, leaf nodes which will be uh, this flat polygon billboards and the wartboard use the influence of wind on a leaves group so um, there are also sliders for automatically boosting uh, the movement on thin um, branches for example or on uh, on longer branches or on the top parts of the plant or on outer parts of the plant so the basic idea would be to simply turn on wind um, by default in all the settings this will create your bone rigging structure then use the global sliders to um, tweak the wind globally and then for your la last fine-tuning um, go into the indiv individual nose and um, tweak the wind there and finally for the constant wind to, just to show that one to you let's use a value of 20 and show the control in here um, controls not visible okay yeah there it is so that's the direction the wind is blowing into and I'll simply set this to 50 and you can see that <laughs> the constant wind is currently not doing much with all of these segments because they don't have a wind and gust motion active but if I go to that segment now that crazy one in the middle and turn on wind and gust motion you can now see that this segment is being bent by the constant wind and you can change the direction of the wind either by moving that arrow or by changing the direction directly in here and you can use the circle but for decreasing um, or increasing the strength of the wind so you can see that the value is being dialed down as I move the mouse around this cursor and so that's a way to simulate um, the um, plant uh, wind direction from a constant strength and um, the constant wind only has an effect um, when you use the um, gusts uh, of wind setting within the nodes. I know that was quite a ton of information to take in um, and uh, I hope I didn't uh, uh, lose you at some point 
in uh, during that demonstration and uh, you can ask questions now and I will simply show you what um, the tweaked wind settings look like on the palm tree. So one question is uh, about baking. Yes, you, c you bake it um, while exporting it uh, to your uh, DCC app. You can either export it with um, the bones active, so you can uh, select them as animated bones. Um, but this will quickly bug down your application because uh, you might have a ton of bones um, with complex plants. And uh, the other option is to use animated points and export this as an, as an animated point cloud, but this will generate um, huge data. So just to be aware. And so this is what it looks like with um, wind applied to the palm tree. Needs to calculate for a second. Yeah, so I got a stormy breeze in here. Oh, sorry, that was the wrong file. Um, I tweaked that file. I need to reload the correct one. My mistake. Um, so that should be the correct one. So let's try that again. Yes, it's going to be generating a lot of bones. And it's still pretty strong for whatever reason. Um seems I didn't uh seems I didn't save the 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 changes that I made recently. Um Too bad uh, because I tweeted earlier this day. So there's only subtle movement with the calm setting. And let's load a stormy preset and see what that looks like. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. It seems I didn't save my changes. So too bad because that that's uh, quite a strong movement, and it's too strong. I'm afraid. So you were trying to get something in the middle, um, something between calm and super stormy. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And I, ha I had a great looking animation and I apparently um, didn't save it. <laughs> well, maybe um, you know, what you could do is, that, is animate, make a little video of it and post it to the forums yeah. at some stage. Yeah, I will. Um, yeah. Yeah, we can do that as a supplement uh, video yeah. and just distribute to everyone yeah I will do that sorry guys I wish I could have shown that to you live now <laughs> um yeah but that's how you work with wind and TPF okay right, yeah let's move on yep okay so um these were the most um, time consuming uh, things that I wanted to show you today we can now move quicker through the rest of the webinar um, so yesterday I promised you that I'd show you how to work with age, season, and health. For this I would like to demonstrate a simple concept. Let's uh, add an advanced segment. And we would now like to make this segment grow with age. So by going to the setup tab uh, we can see that age, health, and season are all disabled. And they will remain disabled as long as there is nothing connected to these input nodes here. So um, generally speaking, all of these sliders output values. Um, for uh, the H slider, um, the, the range of values is indicated by uh, the maximum H that, the, that you enter here. So by default it's 20. So the values that the slider will output will go from 0 to 20. Um, this was different in prior versions of Plant Factory. 
And uh, so in order uh, to, uh, don't, uh, to not break the backwards combati combati compatibility with uh, plans from 2015 and 2014, you can add um, the input node uh, maturity to your scene. So this node will always output the range of um, that uh, slider from 0 to 1, no matter what you enter for maximum age. However, um, what you enter for maximum age will be the sub-steps that the slider can move. So with the maturity you get 0 to 1 depending on uh, where you move that slider and uh, with a sub of 10 for example this um, node will output 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 etc until 1. And for health, um, the health input will also output 0 to 1 and season as well. So um, let's say we would now like to influence the length of this uh, cylinder of the segment with the H slider. For this we are going to need um, to link the length to the H slider. So how are we going to do this? By doing a left click on the name of the parameter we can go to connect parameter. And this will now um, extract the value that we had in here as a separate node. And by unfolding the segment node, we can now see that the input of the length is now connected to this node, which is called a random range because you can indicate randomness to the value. Okay, so I just told you that uh, the maturity value uh, input node outputs values from 0 to 1, depending on the position of the slider. So if we now want to change the length of um, the segment, all we need to do is multiply the value of the slider with um, the length of our cylinder. For this we're going to add a combiner, multiply inputs node, and let's connect our value for the length and our value for the slider. And the result of this multiplication will then drive the length of our segment. And now when we go to the setup tab, um, the slider became active because we now have connected something to the slider, either age or maturity. And by going to zero we can now see the cylinder growing from zero in length to the full 10 meters in 20 steps. And we could also um, influence the growth to make it non-linear. So let's add a filter, for example. And I'll use a simple filter curve. And let's filter our, uh, our uh, value from the slider. And right now it's linearly, so the plan growth linearly, the min minimum value of the slider is zero. And if we only want to grow the plant when the slider reaches uh, reaches at least um, f yeah, 50 percent of um, its um, values, then we can s say, okay, the first 50 percent of the slider sh should always output zero, and then the plant should only start to grow around 50 percent. Let's give it a try. So the plant is not growing until we hit the number 10 probably, or 11, yeah. So now it's only starting to grow uh, with um, the last 50% of the slider. And this is how you build plants with age and health and season. You link an arbitrary amount of uh, parameters to these sliders, you use filters to control when these um, settings become active. For example, think about um, the season slider and you want uh, leaves to disappear, we can give that a try. So let's add a couple of leaves. I'll just make them bigger and they should start at the surface of the segment. So let's change it to surface and let's use eight leaves and we would like the leaves to disappear once the slider reaches winter, which will be around, I believe, um, yeah, 60, uh, between 50 and 60 percent. So this slider outputs values from 1 to 0. 
but we need the values to be 0 to 1, so exactly the opposite. Um, so let's use a map filter, which will invert the values of the slider. So we have 0 to 1, and we want the slider to output 1 to 0. And now let's add a filter to that that node. And we don't want anything to happen with the leaves until 50%. Um, percent. So let's keep a value of 1, of 100% leaves presence until um, we reach about 50%. So I'll add another point in here and then we'll slowly drop the amount of leaves, maybe not that slowly, a little bit faster, until uh, we reach um, yeah, a value of 75%. So all the leaves will be uh, will disappear between 50% and 75% of the slider. So let's go to the um, children's tab and to the distribution tab. Let's extract the number of children, of leaf children, which is the number 8. Once again, let's add a multiply node. Combiner multiply inputs. And let's multiply the value of the season slider with the number of children and now by going oh okay I did exactly the opposite apparently <laughs> yeah so I shouldn't have reversed that filter sorry um, yeah so we now keep the, um, the leaves until about 50% and then uh, the leaves slowly start to disappear until we reach 75% and this can be used to simulate the plant going from from fall to winter and yeah so that's the uh, basic idea of building plants with age season health any questions Okay, any questions nope. on that last section? This, this when Daniel first showed me this, I was uh, I, I was really uh, happy to see this. This is something I probably wouldn't have even thought about um, uh, that Plant Factory could do. But uh, great to see these features. Okay, no questions. Um, that's great. Um, okay, what else? What uh, what I wanted to show. Okay, then I'd say let's move on to the final two topics for today, and these are the iteration nodes. Um, I prepared an example scene for you, um, so let me open up this tree. <laughs> Andrea is pretty excited. Um, okay, iteration tree, there we are. Yep, okay. Um, we don't want to see the branches in yellow. Okay, so what we can see here is quite an elaborate tree without leaves, mind you. Um, but if you look at it, we only have two notes. We have a note for the trunk. And we have one note that generates all the different levels of branches. So instead of using five or six different nodes for the first and the second and the third branching level and connecting them to each other, we're only using a single no node. How does that work? Well, um, it works by using the so-called iteration nodes. With iteration nodes, you can sort of code or program um, loops into um, your plant. So if any one of you is a programmer, um, this is basically yeah a classic loop that we're building. So I started with a trunk, and then I added a branch, and I said I would like the branch to grow out from the tip of the trunk. And this gave me the first split in here. I said I would like to have three branches uh, growing from the tip of the trunk. And... Um, yeah, so uh, that was the first result. And then I said, okay, um, 
dear TPF, I would like to repeat this exact, pro exact process that I just created. So I would, once you grew this three, uh, these three uh, branches out of the tip of the trunk, I would like you to grow three more branches from each tip and then three more and then three more. And I would like you to do this 10 times. So 10 times, please grow this bran branch and then as the next uh, thing after you grew the branch, go back to that repeat node, repeat this a second time, a third time, a fourth time, until uh, you reach the number that I indicated here. And I can show you what this looks like. So with zero, we get zero branches, because this is zero times executed. With one, we get the first three branches. Then let's do this a second time. They split again. A third time a fourth time, fifth time, sixth time, and so on. And this will progressively generate a more complex tree. And um, I set the branch to inherit 85% of um, the radius of the previous level. So each time re we repeat this process, it's inheriting 85% of 85% of 85%. So the a radius is progressively getting uh, thinner and thinner and thinner. And uh, finally, when I'm done with uh, all the 10 iterations, I can add another loop node, for example, um, yeah, the end node. And this tells TPF, okay, I executed um, this loop 10 times. Now, what should I do next? And so with the end node, I can now place, um, for example, leaves on um, yeah the last iteration, so on the thin twig, so let's give that a try. <laughs> a little bit too big and let's make the leaves smaller. Yeah, and there we are. Um, of course, uh, let's just use another material for the leaves so that we can see that better. Yeah, so what we just uh, created is an entire plant with only three nodes, but it has an incredibly elaborate branching structure to it. And now I can hear you ask, okay, that's uh, all nice and good, but what if I would like to um, influence the look of, I don't know, the fifth branching level, the fifth iteration, how can I do this? And there is a node for this, and this node is called iteration N where n obviously stands for the number of, iter of the iteration of the current one, so for example for the fifth iteration. Um, so uh, this uh, node um, returns a value that is expressed as a ratio of um, the current iteration to the maximum number of iterations. So for um, the the fifth iteration it would, would return uh, the ratio of 5 to 10, so 1 half 0 0.5 as a value. And by using this um, node, and TPF just froze for whatever reason, okay. By using this node and using a filter curve, for example, what we just did with the age and health, um, by using this node, we can now influ influence, um, for example, the, the um, length or the gnarliness. Let's use the gnarliness. Um, so let's go to the influences input to access perturbation and let's add the gnarliness strength and we can now see that the gnarliness is um, at minus one, let's set this to zero. So the first iterations are pretty straight and ungnarly and later iterations get progressively um, gnarlier and gnarlier. So this is represented to the curve. If we would like to make intermediate um, iterations um, gnarlier, then we would raise uh, the curve with intermediate values and uh, maybe decrease the gnarliness on later iterations. So let's give you an extreme example. Um, let's remove the gnarliness altogether from later iterations. So we have um, pretty straight final tweaks 
and uh, a rather gnarly um, appearance of the in-between iterations. So um, this is the uh, basic overview of the iteration nodes. Any questions? So Uwe is asking whether um, a tree with iteration needs less resources than a tree with um, a dozen segment nodes. Um, personally, I believe so, yes, but I'm not sure um, you'd probably have to ask Ian about it, but, but I have a feeling that they uh, these trees are being computed faster. And these iteration nodes are only available in studio and producer, by the way, but they have been there since version 2014, so it's nothing new. Yes, it will randomize. Um, remember that you can uh, add a variation to any of the values. So for um, repeating that branch growth, uh, you still need to indicate where um, the next branching level should grow. So once again, I connected the next node to the branching node to tell TPF to go back and to repeat this process. And so I have a next tab on uh, for the children uh, distribution. And here I said, okay, please place it again on the tip of the segment and I would like to have a split of two. And by indicating a variation here or everywhere else, you can randomize uh, the growth as well. Okay, so um, before we go to the final um, topic, which is the meshing, um, I'd like to show you the final remaining node that we haven't explored yet. And this is the auto growth node. This is a new feature of uh, TPF 2016. Uh, and this node uh, creates an entire tree with only a single node. And the basic uh, idea behind this tree is that it uses um, iteration nodes internally. And this tree is based on biologic growth algorithms. So it's not only the iteration nodes that are um, included internally in this node, but um, the programmers also um, try to simulate um, the influence of light and shadows, etc. So while growing the plant, it will start competing for light and it would, will look very natural. So to give you uh, just an idea, I'm not going to get in, in depth into these settings, but um, let's uh, go to the H tab. So the number of iterations is directly linked to the H slider. So currently we're using about 10 iterations. So let's push this to a higher value and we get this tree. Let's go back to the parameters and um, let's add um, a little bit of axis perturbation. In this case, the setting is called angular noise. And we can already see what this is going to produce. And so with uh, the apical slider, for example, we can define whether uh, we rather want a broad leaf or, or a round tree. So by moving this more towards the right, we get sort of um, a yeah, single tree lonely tree. By uh, going more into a negative range, we get more of a rounded tree, more of a um, bush-like um, appearance. And um, so uh, with the shattering group, um, we can tell TPF uh, if we connect a leaf to this. And unfortunately, uh, the autogrowth node only works with the flat leaf node at the moment, which is a, a downside in my opinion. Um, so I'm pretty disappointed, um, to be honest, but I hope that it will at least work with wire boards in the future. So let's just uh, decrease the size of the leaves and reload the material like this. Um, okay, so let's say these are our leaves and we can now tell TPF how big these leaves are and how translucent they are, so how much light they uh, let through. So let's say these leaves are pretty opaque and they don't let light through, then we can increase the shadowing strength. And uh, what this will do is uh, the uh, it will tell the biological growth algorithm that a lot of uh, the branches don't receive enough light and they will start to die. And so TPF will calculate based on these settings um, how much light each branch branch receives and once it 
um, doesn't receive a certain amount of light, which is uh, this threshold here, the shedding threshold, um, it's considered to be a dead branch. And by using this decay setting, we can now tell TPF when to remove these dead branches. So let's increase the decay setting and we should be able to see that um, more and more branches will disappear. So let's increase the shedding amount a little bit. Yeah, so the plant will have less and less um, branches as the branches are being considered to be dead. And so there are quite a number of um, options here for uh, generating the growth shape. You can tell TPF whether the branches will rather grow from the sides or from the tip and how they will be oriented up and down, etc. And the cool thing is that you get an entire tree with iterative approach, uh, fully compatible with age and, and uh, everything just within one single node. And uh, what's also great is that you can use the profile cut to um, cut this um, tree into a certain shape. So once again, um, let's give it a try. And let's maybe create a shape like this. And let's increase the radius or decrease the radius. And let's say I don't want to cut the entire top. Yeah, so um, these values in here, the bottom height and the top height for the cut and also the radius, so the volume that's going to be cut needs to match the plant um, size, obviously. But it's pretty cool um, with this feature and the filter you can create plants that are being cut into a specific shape. So um, that's a very, very cool new feature. It does have a bit of a steep learning curve, I have to admit. Um, but the results are extraordinary uh, once you understand how this growth node works. And uh, remember that if you build a plant with age, season and health, all of these sliders will turn active and they will also be available inside VU uh, for your convenience. When you load a plant um, inside VU and double click it uh, in the plant editor, you will have access to these sliders to modify the plant um, to your liking. Any questions? Okay, any questions on that last section? Nope. Okay, then let's turn to the very final topic. Um, yeah, you can do shapes. Um, the shapes are going to be created with the profile filter. So um, there are a couple of um, examples in the manual. Um, well, Andrea, you would have to ask Ion about that. So I will simply open up the manual to show your render. Um, that would be the quickest thing to do. Um, so auto growth. Yeah, so here you can see how you can use this filter to shape uh, the plant into a specific shape. And um, no, unfortunately, you cannot import um, an external object for the auto growth node. That's not possible. <laughs> and uh, one thing uh, that's worth pointing out is instead of a parent curve, because there is no parent in here, uh, sorry, a current geometry curve, I mean, um, you have age curves. So this is basically what we did with uh, the iteration N a few minutes ago with the iteration nodes. So you can use these curves to decrease or increase the strength of each iteration level um, based on, on the number of itera iterations, so based on the age that you enter here. Okay. Um, for uh, the meshing option, we will um, reload the palm tree. And now we're finally getting into that level of detail and meshing stuff that we were talking about. And it's pretty easy. So you can find all of the meshing options on the meshing tab. And I will turn on um, the wireframe display. 
and um, so generally speaking you can select uh, the type of geometry that should be used for generating the plant. By default the geometry that's being used um, are quads. So um, there we are. You can switch this to triangles for example. And I hope you can see it now all the quads are uh, divided into triangles. And there's also uh, the option to use a mixture of quads and triangles so TPF will uh, decide upon its own when to use quads and when to use triangles. Basically it will use triangles whenever um, it uh, uh, sees it fit so that you can save some polygons. And yeah, so that's the basic idea behind uh, switching between the type of geometry. So it's pretty easy. Um, so the second uh, thing is there are several intelligent algorithms available for generating the amount of polygons. And by default, um, the amount of polygons is set to automatic uniform. With this, uh, TPF will try to generate very uh, uniform polygons everywhere so that you get a clean topology. Um, very useful for uh, sculpting plant parts in an external application, for example. However, there's also the option of automatic adaptive. And automatic adaptive will um, now allocate more polygons to places where there will be more details. So, for example, um, let me go back to a new scene after all. Um, so, let's add a segment and let's distort this segment. Yeah, so let's display the wireframe and let's get, get back to the meshing tab. And so with automatic uniform we have the same amount of polygons everywhere. I'll subdivide the plan just a couple of times so that we can see this. And if we now switch to automatic adaptive uh, we can now see that TPF will generate a less uniform distribution because it will try to save polygons where you won't need that many polygons and it will allocate more polygons to those areas that are heavily distorted. So um, that's a good uh, way of saving polygons if you don't need a clean topology. We can compare the polygons. We have 4600 versus 8768. So if I turn off wireframe, um, oops, there's a minimal change in the visible geometry, but we only have about 50% of the polygons. And um, for this automatic adaptive mode, you can even uh, tell uh, Vu where um, where to um, include more polygons. Either um, if it's a static mesh, then it will try to uh, maintain a good quality overall um, for the topology. Or if it's a mesh for animation, TPF will analyze where uh, the plant will bend the most. And so uh, for animation, um, we need a lot more polygons around here for uh, the tree not to have any artifacts. So by switching the automatic adaptive mode to optimize for animation, TPF will automatically add more polygons to the places that would otherwise cause problems while animating this. And um, there's also the option for uh, manual meshing and that's uh, the final option. So let's switch to manual. And now with manual meshing, we have a group of new settings that are now active in the segment group and these were grayed out before. And now we can indicate exactly how many polygons we would like the um, a geometry to have around the circumference and along the height. So let's um, say parametric. So parametric is along the entire length. So we have five polygons along the height at the moment. So let's say we would like to have 15 polygons along the height and we would like to have 10 polygons along the circumference and now we can um, yeah, influence the amount of polygons all manually by our own and it's also possible to uh, make polygons aggregate at a certain 
uh, parts of the plant by using the filter curve. Right now we're not seeing much because all we have is an undistorted fil uh, cylinder geometry. But that's the way um, the meshing in TPF works. And finally about these level of details. Um, you can set up a uh, an arbitrary amount of level of details simply by indicating the number here. And you can switch through the level of details by switching to that cursor mode. And here you can indicate when TPF and VU as well will switch between each level of detail based on the distance to camera or on the rather on the resolution of the plant. So let's zoom out a bit. I uh, need to check, uh, switch to auto. Yeah, so that's the full level of detail. And now the plant reached a resolution of 270. Now we're at 135. And so progressively uh, VU and TPF will switch between the level of details dynamically. And you can check whether VU should use this level of detail for rendering in ecosystems as well. And with the simplification boost you can indicate how much um, each level of detail should be simplified. So with a value of 1 each level of detail will unsubdivide the poly uh, polygon resolution once. So let's give it a try. Level of detail 5 has 170 polygons for, okay, 46. Of course, this is a dynamic um, um, decision, so it's based on your on your geometry, but that's the general idea. Yeah, so instead of 46, we now have 20, 12, 8. So it's a rough estimate of how much that thing is simplified. And uh, through this, you can easily create an arbitrary amount of level of details. You can specify the levels of detail separately for each meshing mode. So for a real time, you can specify new level of detail settings. And um, for, uh, with all of these level of details, if you export the plan to another application, you can do that by going to export and check export level of details. And this will generate, in this case, five um, versions of the plan. So the full quality version and the four lower resolution level of details. And that sort of sums everything up that I wanted to show you with TPF. Um, I can tell you the software can even get a lot deeper than what we um, explored yesterday and today. You can um, get into incredibly elaborate uh, dependencies. You can um, make other parameters depend on other settings which we didn't go into today. Um, you can indicate um, how likely it is that TPF will choose a certain random value. For example, if you have a, a value of 10 plus minus 3, you can tell TPF to pick ran, uh, values around 8 more often than values around 12. So it's incredibly intricate how deep you can get. And these are all advanced things that maybe we uh, will be able to discuss in another session. So I'd like to open the final question uh, round now. So is there anything else you would like to know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there is this question. Uh, is it from KLR? Um, is it possible to animate parameters of the volumetric settings in hypertexture material? So that's a VOO question, um, but I believe it should be possible. Um, you simply need to display the timeline in VOO and then go to any keyframe and change uh, the setting of the the volumetric uh, material and then go to another keyframe and change another setting and Vu will ask you whether you want the material to become animated and if you select yes then you just keyframed the parameters of the hypertexture. Yeah Bruno, um, uh, no plans as yet but uh, I think now we've opened up the world of the plant factory uh, on these two occasions on these two sessions. I'm, I'm sure we'll see some others in the future. Um, so it'd be a case of me discussing that with Daniel and also uh, Eon Software. Okay, so um, if there are no further questions, then um, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. It was a pleasure to be here. 
and um, I hope you've not only been flooded with information, <laughs> but also <laughs> but also been able to follow along despite um, all the chit chat. And I'm also available on Facebook, so you can uh, look me up there and send me your questions. And well, I hope you will have a lot of fun with TPF, and you're not afraid of using notes, and um, have a good feeling on how to get started with the software. <laughs> yeah, perhaps uh, Barry or somebody else can fetch the URL for the uh, the trial download. Uh, the is it the what, what edition is it? The I can't remember now. The education edition. I can't remember the name for it. Uh, PLE, probably. PLE, yeah, so if somebody can put the PLE download link in the chat yeah. box. Yeah, Bruno, I know I went a little bit fast through things, especially in, in the last 30 minutes, um, but I wanted to give you a taste of as much as possible. <laughs> it was a um, so I hope it wasn't too fast after all. <laughs> well, Thanks, Ark. Thanks, Greg. <laughs> Yeah, so I'll let you all uh, copy that link from Barry uh, there. Yeah. Um, if I could ask you a question, guys, in case there there was ever a future uh, TPF webinar, what would you like to see more in-depth? Uh, Project-based walkthrough, more animation stuff, more integration stuff. Is there um, anything that you'd be particularly interested in to uh, dig deeper into? So Barry roots. Roots. <laughs> roots. So I will have to scroll up and uh, take a look at, at Christian's um, link earlier. Um, I still want to see uh, which plant he wanted to ask how to approach this. <laughs> well, lots of ideas here. Ah, okay. Well, uh, the basic idea would be to create a segment node for the trunk and uh, create an, a segment node for the root that is connected before the trunk. And you can enable, um, at least in TPF 2016, for the roots to connect with the ground. And there's also a grow, grow an object feature, which I haven't touched upon at all. So you can import objects and make um, only the root, um, root segment nodes um, uh, attached to that object, for example. And uh, then add a little bit of a twist bias in here for for the connection of the the roots uh, with um, the trunk. So there's actually um, that's maybe the last setting that I'm going to show you. There's actually a blending option um, which will create subdivision surfaces for the blending between two things. So let's add two two segments. And on the children's tab, I can now activate blending and say use subdivision surfaces and this will create clean topology and by yeah using a twist bias probably on on uh, the root uh, segment you would get similar structures as here with the photograph yeah i was having a discussion with tom uh, before the webinar started and we were talking about the fact you could have fruits uh, that sounded really interesting. We've had a couple of suggestions to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And Tom also asked if you could show us how to grow money on trees. <laughs> there's there's uh, there is a money tree tutorial by uh, Vladimir Chopin from Giga Play for TPF 2014. I'm not kidding. Um, trees. That's really good news. <laughs> and about modeling fruits, um, if you go to the tutorial section, there are numerous tutorials which uh, were created by me uh, for version 2015. And you can open up um, the fruits um, scene, for example. And here I used the radius curves for the segments and um, the section and profile uh, filters in here to model uh, these fruits interactively within TPF. So yes, you can model fruits even uh, in TPF. And mm -hmm. by the way, um, let's just open any tutorial scene. If you go to the to display and um, info, you will get this panel and when you select a node, um, you will get an information about the settings of this node. 
and uh, what uh, I created here uh, for uh, illustration purposes. So that's a tutorial section for you to learn. Okay, so I'm going to make sure we got a copy of the chat transcript because we've got lots of suggestions there so we can... Great, I wasn't later. able to read them right yeah. now. I'll send them on to you. Okay, fantastic. So, guys, if you have any feedback, constructive criticism, something that I should, should be able to do better the next time or something that you particularly enjoyed, I'd uh, be looking forward to hearing from you what you liked, what you didn't like that much, and yeah. So just keep the ideas coming. <laughs> yeah, so there's two forums you can look at. There's the uh, Conocopia 3D. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Barry. <laughs> Gnarly. Oh, Thank yeah. you. I did, at least I didn't get to gripes with anything today. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, it helps us all remember, doesn't it, that attribute now, Gnarly. <laughs> yeah, gnarly. Okay, good to know. <laughs> okay, thank you, everyone.